Hi, I'm Derek Morrison from The Good Wine Shop, and welcome to episode four of Bring Your Own. Today's session takes a look at the Pinot Noir grape in Champagne and Burgundy to compare some of its most famous expressions. We've gathered a group of Pinot lovers to share bottles from their own cellars and to chat about what makes this grape so special and the wine so memorable. Joining us are European Champagne collectors Peter Crawford, aka at Alavoulet, and Dan Rosinov, aka at Champagne Spot, and wine writer Christina Rasmussen. We're really lucky to be hosted by the great team at Kitchen Table and Bubble Dogs in central London for the filming of this episode. Tucked in the back of Bubble Dogs on Charlotte Street, Kitchen Table is one of the most exciting restaurants in London, led by owner Chef James Knappett. You can find them online at www.kitchentablelondon.co.uk. Due to the nature of filming in a working restaurant, please excuse the various machine noises you may hear in the background, as well as the bustling bar. I hope you'll enjoy the episode. Follow us on social media at BYO Podcast and subscribe to the podcast to make sure you catch all future episodes. Thanks for coming tonight, you guys. Uh, really forward to tasting some wines together. Um, why don't we go around the room and, and uh, everybody introduce themselves real quick. Uh, we'll start with you, Dan. Do you want to uh, say a little bit about who you are and where you're from? Hi, guys. I'm uh, Dan Rosnov. Uh, online, I'm also known as a Champagne Spy. I have a blog that have the same name, and my blog is dedicated to only reviewing Champagne. And I come originally from Switzerland, where I grew up in a restaurant close to the French border, so obviously a homegrown affection to French wines such as Pinots, and uh, I somehow ended up in London. Uh, I'm Peter Crawford. I'm uh, a champagne fanatic. I've been collecting uh, champagne for a, a number of years and doing tastings and traveling to the region. And uh, yeah, very excited about this evening to try some Pinot Noirs and some non-sparkling wines, which yes. apparently they make. <laughs> apparently. <laughs> uh, Christina. I'm Christina Rasmussen, and for me it all started uh, about five years ago when I was 21 as a stagiaire uh, with Lula Tour in Bonn, um, so in Burgundy. Uh, since then, I now do wine PR and trade relations with Westbury Communications, um, looking after lots of different clients, including Beaujolais, so Burgundy's next door neighbour. Um, and I also have started writing freelance for about a year and a half now, and the main one being the buyer. Everyone brought a bottle of wine tonight to share from their own cellars that uh, has some special meaning or connection to yourself, so look forward to hearing your anecdotes. But uh, let's start with Dan. Dan, what have, you, what have you brought for us tonight? I have brought uh, Jackson, Dizzy Terre Rouge, from the vintage of 2009, uh, vintage that is known to be good for Pinots as well, so I thought it was, uh, would fit the theme tonight. And um, I did bring the wine for various reasons. First of it, because I love it. It's for me, it's, it's just a great rosé. Um, Jackson is a house that I love very much because I think in terms of champagnes, they're always very vinous. Um, I, th I think it hits like the middle, how do you say? It's like in the middle between champagne and wine. And that's what I love about the champagne, has charisma. But let's uh, have a try. I think you'll see the color says a lot already. Jacques Casson is one of these uh, producers I, 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 I struggle a little bit with, I've got to confess. I, I don't know what it is. They're, 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 they've been very, very, very successful with their um, seven, 700 range. Which, uh, which is, is a very good um, uh, Brut Sans Anne, but it, it, for me, <clears throat> they're the wines, you, you, have to, you have to kind of get into them, you have to kind yeah. of like, yeah, work yeah, yeah, your way into them. Yeah. And for me, I kind of enjoy a little bit more of a wine that, that, that gives itself to you, whereas those wines really, for me, you have to work, work your step your way into them. Whereas this, this particular yeah. cuvee is, is, is almost the flip of it. To me, this is like, this is it. It's giving you exactly what you want from the wine, straight up. Yeah. And, uh, it still has that tight saline sort yeah. of mineral yeah, it's core lovely. to it's it. Sappiness to it. Yeah. And, yeah. It's wonderfully sapid. I mean, it, 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 as you said, it's really vinous. I mean, it has this you know wine-like quality in terms of uh, um, it's not an easy. It's 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 accessible in the way they kind of and inviting, as Peter's saying, but it's not easy. I mean, it's not. Um, I mean, it's. Pretty serious. Like it's serious on the palate. It's quite. It's quite intense on the nose, but it's got a real. I mean, a real. It's got a grip to it. It's really grippy. It's got broad shoulders. Yeah, <laughs> and then so so. It's interesting what you said. I always refer to the wines of Jackson as half geeky, because yeah. I don't like wines that are too geeky, and I don't like wines. When I say wines, I mean champagnes, of course. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Obviously, that wines that are. Um, 
too joyful and too easy. And I think that for me this hits the spot because as I said, I'm looking for a Venice character um, in the wines. And I, I really love Rosé Champagne, but I have to say, for me, there aren't that many good Rosé Champagnes. I think they're stepping up. They're stepping up, yeah. because, stepping up. because it's so difficult, and I hope we're gonna get into this discussion later as well, the balance between venosity and freshness yeah. Yeah. to get it right, especially when you have, you know, you have the saignes on one side, where you have, yeah. you know, macerated, and then you have the one that blend in red wine. So this is very special because it's 100% Pinot Noir, obviously, but 50% of it is done like a saigné with bleeding. Saigné in French means to let the grapes bleed. And 50% is free flowing white juice. So it's mixed. So it's got both the vinous character and the freshness and the soil and, and, and it has no dosage, zero dosage. Yeah, and, and that's quite interesting from this vintage. I think a couple of producers have gone. I it was I their know. first time doing it, right? Which I didn't know that. I didn't actually didn't know that. I, yeah. thought, I would have thought they've had, because the, the, the 08, which we had a couple of days ago, had two and a half, I think, 2.5. But yeah. I didn't realize. I mean, that, and you did, that's astonishing for a non blue set. I think they probably have so much fruit in that vintage yeah. right there. Yeah. I mean, would you guess necessary. blindly taking this that this is. No, no dosage at all? No. It's like... no, certainly not. I mean, it's really quite round and rich. And, and you know, you, you get that stupidity, that, that, um, that salinity, that, um, that, that earthy character on the, um, mm. on the palate. Mm. But the finish is like ripe red fruits. I mean, it's like, it's like eating cranberries. I mean, yeah. it's got yeah, this yeah, nice. really juicy, bitter, juicy, you know, yeah. like cranberry. I mean, it, it really has that character on the finish. And I, um, which, no, I mean, it's really resolved. It has such a, it has such a wonderful texture on the palate. It's really captivating, but at the same time, really rewarding. I mean, as you say, it gives so much pleasure to the wine, but it's, uh, it's, yeah, it's fascinating. Is, uh, it's, so it's 50 of the, um, sorry, 50 of the red and the 50 of the white, 50 Saignet and then 50 um, Blanc de Noir blended together. And it's a single, is it a single vineyard? Single vineyard from DZ, which is not a Grand Cru site, but it's, it's debatable because it's next to a very famous Grand Cru village, which is Ai. So some people in the village, they might say, you know, it's very close to Ai, so it might be Grand Cru-ish, but it's debatable. It's a very a special site because the soil is red. That's why it's called Terre Rouge, Earth, Red, Red Earth. And um, I've talked to the winemaker um, about this. We tasted it together when it came out and I said, and I, I would love to talk about this as we go on. Um, if some of the Champagne winemakers do relate the roses to Burgundy or not, if they call them, you know, this is the Vone Romane of Champagne or something. And I asked him this question like I always do, and he said, if this was a Burgundy, he would say it would be probably a Givry. I just want to ask you, one thing you said was that you don't think there's that many great roses. What, what do you, in your mind, what defines a great rose Champagne? Or what are, what are you looking for, or what's stylistically or... Um, um, personality-wise in the wines? Well, I was saying this because in terms of balance, it's the first thing I'm looking to. Of course, the balance goes always in, in correlation to personality and to house style and everything because, above all, I admire personality and I think this is yeah, a yeah, wine yeah, that yeah, has right. personality because it's so unique and it's just what I love about the champagne, it's diversity of wines. And to answer your question, Derek, I'm looking for balance because I think there's a fine line in rosé when it's too heavy or when it's too light. And, and, and I think this balance is very, it's a very fine line how you're going to achieve it, that it's not too fresh or that it's too fruity and too plush. Because then we're talking, is it then wine or champagne? And that's what I love for me personally. I love this kind of borderline between champagne and wine. Yeah, and he, and he actually, exactly what you're saying, he's achieved that perfectly with this wine. Yeah. He's achieved that yeah. balance really, really brilliantly. So you get that, you get that delightful freshness. And in fact, I would hazard a guess. It's just this color, it's just so... I, 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 <clears throat> it's one of those wines that, that teeters on the edge. You close your eyes, it's, it's a blanc with that lovely cherry yeah. fruit and yeah. that little, little kind of playful notes that you, that you want. So. It is that, whereas some of the other wines, and I won't name any of them, but some of the other wines are definitely heavy on, the, on that venosity way. It's a, it's a wine. It's almost it's too fat sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I love them too. I love good saignets, fantastic, or a good rosé. But as I said, 
balance and personality. And I think also another reason why I choose this wine is this has evolved in the last, it's only been out since 2003. You know, so there's only been just in 2003, and then there was uh, seven, eight, nine, and five, and every year it was different. At the beginning, there was more Meunier, and then they still kept Meunier and Pinot from the same parcel. And as they evolved, this is actually only the, uh, the correct me if I'm wrong, I think only the second one that has 100%. Uh, no, I think the, the 08 was, was the only other one. The 07, I think. 07, right. I think Maybe. the 07 was, was, but anyway, and it's just stunning. And now they come and they say, yeah. We're not going to do it red anymore. Yeah, yeah. Next one is going to be a blonde de noir because I think it's better. And, and I think that's fascinating because, and it's brave at the same time to evolve, yeah. you know, to never rest on all your, your laurels. And as I said, I don't know as much about Burgundy as you guys, but I would really curious how this works in Burgundy because in my mind, not knowing the region, it's like more traditional, more... They do one style or whatever. How do they progress? I think in I think in you know any time we're talking about great wine or this the the this uh, this um, level of wines that we celebrate in this way, there's always you know an interpretation or reaction to what you're given. I mean, every vintage is different in Champagne, whether it's in Burgundy and the great winemakers, the great domains, the great uh, um, growers. Um, um, uh, they adjust to what it is, and and you know the Chiquet family. They've said that. Yes, they're not going to do a rosé, but maybe that's just of since 2009 to the vintages they've had of that wine. Yeah. Maybe, you know, you speak to them once they've got more of that juice in a barrel or after another harvest, they might say, this actually is perfect for, yeah. for a rosé, so it'll I be bet interesting. I that will happen as well. <laughs> I hope so. I mean, because this is a, it'd be a tragedy well, if this is the last vintage. I, I remember them saying exactly that with the 08. I remember them saying, you know, oh, we're not going to do any more of this. And I bet you what happened was, was they turned around and said, this wine isn't, the balance of it isn't quite right, which is why it's so bizarre for them to no, go no yeah. do so. Or it's the like perfect vintage for it, right? You know, so if you have the perfect vintage to not do something like this, but it would be its own tragedy to some extent. I think it's funny too because you know Pinot Noir is such a funny grape. I mean, in terms of um, what I love about you know we're going to be tasting two champagnes from 100% Pinot Noir um, that you guys have brought tonight, and they couldn't be more couldn't be more different. And yeah. you know, there's. You know, sometimes Pinot Noir, you're getting this in this rosé specifically. You're getting that you get some of that earthiness, but it's more about like this bright, seductive red fruits, and then having this tension of the earth that's kind of giving it some some spine. But uh, there's so many other, you know, mushroomy or, or more savory kind of characteristics that the grape can give, in, and um, it's just fascinating in champagnes to see the spectrum of of Pinot Noir champagnes and, and and then that's not even talking about them at a different state of evolution. Well exactly so. and even now when you when you go back to this now just even after you know 10-15 minutes it's starting to give so yeah, much yeah, more. Yeah. This would be fascinating to try. By the way your glass is empty. Yeah, it is. Well Peter why don't you pour uh, pour us all a little bit of the champagne you brought tonight and uh, tell us a bit about it. This is Thank you. one of my absolute favorite producers of the uh, of the current moment. Um, Ulysse Collin. Um, so he's a he's for it's Olivier Collin, and he's from a village called Congy, and it's not a well-known village at all. It's a kind of lesser-known little bit on the bottom end of the Côte de Blanc. He's just somebody who's kind of followed on in the in the footsteps of of Celos. I think he's he's created something very very unique, very individual in the world of Champagne. Um, he he um, vinifies an oak. He has a number of parcels in Congi itself, and then a number further, much further south in Cézanne. This is actually from Cézanne. Now, the, the area is the Côte de Blanc, but he has Pinot Noir grapes, and this is from um, Cézanne. It's a two and a half hectare parcel in uh, Cézanne, and it's east-facing, chalk limestone. The, the wine, I must confess, has never, it never spoke to me, this particular wine, um, the Pinot Noir, never really spoke to me until 2012 vintage. And then I started to feel that connection with it. And for me, it has surpassed the Pirier. Um, it's not quite up there with the Loise, I'll, I'll be honest with you, which is my favorite from him, but it is right, it's stepped right up there and it is a proper wine. It's a proper wine and it's got this intensity, it's got this, Extraction. Oh. He's, he just he he has, he stepped up and created something properly unique within the region and the area, and I think it's stunning. Even even I'll say even within his own portfolio. I mean even within his own cuvées, 
this wine always stands out to me. Um, you know, and it, it's interesting to taste this next to um, the rosé that Dan brought. Obviously, the color of the, of the rosé that Dan brought, it, it has this um, wonderfully, you know, deeply pigmented, you know, for a rosé. I mean, it's got this wonderful kind of cranberry, cranberry hue, but then you put the, the Le Mayon, Le Mayon, he also does the rosé rosé um, de Mayon from the same vineyard, um, which is one of my favorite rosés yeah. in it's Champagne. A, a I think it's, it's, it's exceptional. And both the rosé and the Blanc de Mayon, the contrast makes me love each of the, both of them more because they couldn't be more different. And this Blanc de Noir could not be more different in so many ways from the wine that Dan's brought, both in textures, in aromas. Yeah. Um, but it's fascinating, and you know, we're, we're ge geographically we're looking at Dizzy a bit further north, and we're in Cezanne, which is um, for people who aren't aware, it's quite quite significantly further south. And yeah. we're going to journey from there through Cezanne and then into and the, the Côte de Nuit of Burgundy, and exactly. it's it's fascinating to see. Not that every every reflection of the differences is due to that geography, but it's just interesting to see how different these wines can be as we go. Yeah, exactly. You get a sense. I mean, he he obviously he plays around with oak. And you definitely feel that, you know, this salinity and extraction, but it's still incredibly clean and crystalline and, and focused. And I, I really love what he does with that. So for me, you, you, it's always a struggle. Um, you know, there are certain people in the wine world, um, and certainly in Champagne, they're talking about terroir and they're talking about that. But you do start... This you, is winemaker. Yeah, this exactly. This is all it's, about winemaker. It's winemakers. the winemaker uh, who's creating something yeah, really yeah. special and he's, and he's doing something in a particular way. And that, for me, is just incredible. It's but I also lovely. think it has such incredible structure, so like coming back on this in 10, 20 years yeah. from now on will be really interesting. Yeah, yeah no, and he's, su he's such a lovely guy what he does, and he's, he's also, he's, he's got that spark, and I always find this in, in his wine. For me, this is just always so charismatic. I mean, this is one of my first grower loves, I think back, uh, I think, I connected with it earlier than you were. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for me, it's always my favorite because it's just, mm, it has this charisma and 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 open it to me and 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 the funny thing is if, if I mean if you would taste it blindly and you know a bit the cha the champagnes from the from the Cezanne area, you know they're they're more like known for they're quite sunny they have a sunny disposition they're more of this kind of tropical fruits yeah, yeah, exactly. aromas exactly. a little bit a bit more plush a lot of uh, a lot of champenois up you know we're talking Montagne de Vase and up they use them more for blending, actually I would say mm -hmm. so it's quite fascinating that a guy. Yeah. Like Olivier comes and says, you know what, I'm taking these parcels there and I'm doing something really special. Yeah. And doing something that sort of makes the most of that, what you get naturally from... Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, and, and as you say, he creates it with a style that is just... It, it, there's so much intensity from it and you just yeah. like, there's so much grip. So you, you, you completely caught up in the wine and that's what's yeah. so amazing about it. And then if he, if he is using so much oak or whatever in, in the winemaking style, and some people might say it's more winemaking driven, but then you have fruit that can support that. So it's about yes, making the most of that yeah, for yeah. sure. Exactly. And that's what's so it's the same in Burgundy, sorry. right? So really, yeah. Oh, I yeah. think so anyway. Very much. I mean, we we um, we think of these guys that are, or they get described very often as the kind of Burgundians of uh, um, Burgundians of Champagne, and and you can see why when you I think when you look at the you know, obviously the Jackson has a wonderfully vinous. Very, as you said, it's a, this is a great, the, the Jackson from Dan, the rosé, is a wonderful example of, um, as you say, a really excellent balanced rosé champagne. And it has all of those qualities. It's, it's a, I, I would say it's one of the, you know, for me, I, I agree with Dan, this is one of my favorite um, rosés that I've had in the last few years. And it, it, it reflects the earth, it reflects, the, it reflects everything that you would want a great wine to say about where it's made and how it's made and, um, and who made it in terms of it has this balance, this precision and this uh, uh, uniqueness, I guess, in terms of, I can't name many rosé champagnes that have this distinct personality and this kind of equilibrium. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's important. But then as we move to the Luis Colón, it's a completely different wine, it's a completely different interpretation, and it has this, if we say Burgundian quality, it's starting to move in terms of textures and, and um, the, the way that it feels in the mouth in a completely different direction. And the aromatics, I mean, funny, on the finish of the Elise Klein, you do get a bit of this kind of cranberry, um, cranberry skin kind of, uh, um, maybe not the, might, not the juiciness of the fruit, but there's a little hint of that kind of red, Red, uh, red bitterness, yeah, 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 exactly. Um, exactly. gooseberry kind of a little. Bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's really, like it's really cool. As well and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly right. But then you get this wonderful. You feel the oak. It gives this lovely texture and caress of this tropical fruit. But it's, 
not so much like uh, a bright and blousy that maybe you, you it's typically associated with the area, but it's more like this textured mango pulp or it's deep. you know it's really yeah like Christina said it's really deep and it's uh, it's really cool. Both of these wines would be stellar with food. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah really, definitely. really fantastic. Well, I think what this is starting to show too is like the spectrum of. You know, um, both in, in, within Champagne and Pinot Noir. I mean, Pinot Noir gets kind of, I think, unfairly pigeonholed as this very narrow type of wines that it can create. And you know, not just within Champagne, but even within these these small appellations, the spectrum is massive. I mean, you can do both of these with completely different courses of food. One is because of the textures and the way that it works. And but I wouldn't say any either of them is any less reflective of the integrity of Pinot Noir, let's say. No, exactly. Um, it's just showing it's different shades. It's a perfect champagne it. spectrum for sure. Yeah. And the funny thing is also when you think of it, I mean the most grapes grown in Champagne are black, right? But we think of Champagne as a white-ish white. yeah. wine. But how many top top cuvées could you name just like this, that are 100% Pinot Noir. There aren't many, actually. There aren't actually many Blanc de Noir. If, 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 if you think of it from the top that one would note in his uh, 98 to 100 point scores, whatever, yeah. magazine. So I think it's, it's a fascinating example, Le Mayo, and I just love it so much as well, yeah. not just in terms of charisma and what is possible, but also that it's possible to make good Pinot Noir, modern way, that has venosity and freshness, so I think these, these two just fit well together. Yeah, very well. So we'll move a little bit further south now into the Côte de Nuit, and um, Christine, you brought a, um, a burgundy for us tonight. Do you want to tell us a bit about uh, the wine you brought and why, yeah. why you chose it? So I've just come back um, from Burgundy about two and a half weeks ago, um, where I went to visit Thomas Berry, who is the assistant winemaker at Jean-Yves Bizot. Um, which actually was a little bit of a longer story how I got to him because I was down in Beaujolais about two or three months ago now with one of my favorite winemakers in the world who is Fabien Dupéré of Jules Dijonais um, and he is really good friends with Jean-Yves Bizot so he was like to me you have to absolutely you have to go and visit him he does amazing things um, and so through that I then went to visit him so I brought along the Von Romanet 2014 and so the reason I decided to bring Bizo with me is because I feel he does things a little bit differently to how others do things in Burgundy. So he kind of only started his own domain in about 1993 because his um, parents and his grandparents had had his, um, the vineyards, uh, which are about 2.5 hectares in Vonormenay um, for the past 60 or 70 years, but they tended to rent out the vineyards to, to others. Um, and then Jean-Yves, he was a geologist and he then took over the domain from his parents um, and went on to do winemaking and he did a, a viticulture degree and then he said that when he started to become a winemaker that's when he sort of threw all of that out the window and he just sort of went very much with how he felt about the wine. So he um, began actually making the wines in 95 and then when 98 came, came along he decided to rein in all sulphur use. Um, and I'm not necessarily um, pro or against sulphur. Like for me, it's, I just think it's fascinating to come across a wine that uses so little because it's, um, I read an article the other day um, where it likened using sulphur to um, like being a trapeze artist. <laughs> and then what I think is unusual about this wine is that um, it's 100% whole bunch and 100% new wood, which there are a lot of the top end winemakers in Burgundy doing it, but it's something I think we see a little bit less. We see someone who's doing maybe 40, 50%, up to 75% whole bunch, or the opposite with new woods. You, I mean, you still see Dujac and Romane Conti and stuff doing 100, 100, but there's not as much of it, and that's why I think he no, does it very well. Especially at the village level. Um, I mean, that's... Um, it's not so often that you see that um, they're doing 100% new wood yeah. on their village level cuvées. Um, you know, we'll taste another another Burgundy where uh, someone who's quite famous for some of their oak and, and um, you know, shamed in the past for some of their excessive use of, <laughs> of new oak on some of their cuvées. But uh, um, on his on his uh, um, village level, he uses very little, and, and you see that a lot with some of the top yeah. growers. So it's quite uh, it's quite interesting. But Bizo's reasoning for it is because 
if you buy one-year-old or second-year-old woods, it's going to have some kind of sulfur residual stuff in it from cleaning, etc. So he just wants his wines pure as can be, and he's just lucky that he has fruit that, well, to me anyway, can super support that. It's so yeah. fresh. It's, it's incredible. The fruit is beautifully delivered, yeah, it's very and pretty. it delivers the whole way through. You don't feel like there's, a, there's a, a block in it. It just delivers the fruit, and it's all the way through the palate. It's fascinating. So, uh, and all of the second-year barrels are Sold straight away. Yeah. It's, it's wonderfully, as you said, it's really expressive. It's really approachable on the nose and bright. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're talking about 2014 um, Red Burgundy, which is uh, a very good vintage, in my opinion. But also, you know, you, you see with a lot of younger wines, especially in a way, 100% whole cluster, 100% new oak, um, in, in, in such a young Red Burgundy, it can be very inaccessible. These can, wines can be very shut down. Um, and that goes for any, any Red Burgundy of this youth. And this wine is just like silk. In, on, in the palate, I mean, it, and I think, you know, my, my, what I would interpret is, you know, having a very little amount of uh, sulfur is really having uh, a massive impact on, on showcasing this wine's purity in its youth, yeah. um, not going too reductive has, and shut down. I think it has to some degree to do with what he does in the vineyard, so he prunes in a very different way to, as far as I've seen anyway, in Burgundy to how other people prune. So he only has um, two spurs and then two buds and then two shoots whereas everyone else tends to go out a little bit further. So, I mean, in terms of yields, they're super low. It's like 10 to 20 hectolitres per hectare. Right. Um, so. But I think that concentration transfers to gentle winemaking, which transfers to new wood and somehow does like a nice link yeah. from one to each other, yeah. I think. I don't know, that's just my way of thinking about it. But. It's, it's really interesting. We're going to see this is a really nice comparison in contrast to um, um, the next one, who is another vigneron in Burgundy, which is really famous for the for the low yields and concentration of fruit. Um, and Bizot, I think, was uh, um, was neighbors or influenced in some capacity by Henri Jaillet. Yeah, there's a real beauty in this wine. Uh, it, it, exactly that. There's 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 a this, the elegance is just it just kind of it just takes you away. It's it's, it's very well well. Um, I, I'm so used to describing champagne, so it's quite weird to. Come, to a red wine, just feel this kind of almost ephemeral kind of just lifting yeah. of the wine, it just kind of takes you away really, really beautifully. Um, and it is interesting because it, this is this process, if I may take about champagne for a second. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> this this process of sulfur use it is definitely getting a getting a process, it, getting a getting a chant in champagne. You know, mm -hmm. sulfur use has decreased massively in champagne. Yeah. Um, and 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 the way people interact with oxygen has changed. Yeah. You know, we've we've had one one wine, or well, two wines that you know, have a different interaction with an oxygen. We were talking earlier on about the fact that it's the, the uh, sulfur is obviously used to 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 play around with that interaction of oxygen, and and for this, you know, it's beautiful. There's no there's no suggestion that oxygen. So the way what they do is for every single one of their wines, they bottle straight from barrel. So it right. takes them, there's three guys on the team. Yeah. It takes them about a month to bottle everything because they have, I know, they so have per barrel, they have one guy doing the leveling on the bottle, yeah. one guy bottling, and then one guy putting the cork in. Hilarious. How many bottles? Well, it's about, um, a, in a good year, 10,000. It's 3.5 hectares. That's proper craftsmanship. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's to because I think because it's so little sulfur that they yeah. just want to get it into bottle. And it's the same they so they store everything in the vineyard to make sure that nothing gets handled too much. So it goes straight in and straight into fermentation. Oh so. There's so much in common between this wine and the Jackson. I find if you you have them both in, in your glasses, you taste them side by side. You know these wines are like uh, you know different shades of each other. You're obviously getting much more. It's a completely different wine, a completely different Venus experience. But this is what I love about Pinot Noir in this stretch of the world is. I, you can't replicate either of these wines anywhere else in the world, in my opinion, and and um, and that's not to say that they're better or that they're you know there's there's wines from Pinot Noir from all over the world that I find absolutely enchanting, um, but they're different, and there's and and that's um, there's something about the uniqueness of of uh, um, the wines in this region, and you know these are both very individual wines, very captivating and profound in their own way. But when you taste them side by side, I mean, there's a real harmony, and there's and that. Mm. It gets me really excited, and, yeah. and and you know, it's exactly the reason we're tasting the wines we're tasting today. Um, but there's, it's about this like mineral core that's coming through. Obviously, that's more reflective of the of where it's grown, um, and how they've and they how they've kind of uh, not impeded that. But the fruit characteristics, there's a bit of that um, 
beyond just the red fruits, a bit more of this earthy sous bois kind of uh, character in both. And obviously there's going to be a bit of uh, uh, savoriness lent by the whole cluster and, um, and the wood, but um, it's just amazing. In, in vinification terms, these wines are, you know, could not be more different really. The whole cluster of the wood aspect um, removed from it. Um, but to see some of the personalities there is a real, it's, uh, for me, it's really exciting. And, and, and what's What's beautiful is how they play off each other as well. If you were yeah. to sit down and try and play, you know, try them together, you get this delightful um, delivery. You were talking about earthy mineral notes coming from 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 the uh, uh, the red, and then and then and then what it does because it's because it's a red wine, you come back to the champagne, and the champagne has this beautiful little playful wild strawberry note. Mm. Yeah. Which is just I think you get more just, of that sort of incense note as well on the Vendée Romanée. That right. it starts to get a little bit more heady and incensey, and yeah, whereas yeah, then when you have yeah, this, yeah. it's like much yeah, lighter. And this is more playful, right? So yeah. this is then more. It's like you walk through the forest and you get in the nose. You have the wild strawberries yeah. here, and then you go to this wine, and all of a sudden you're in forest floor. But it's a fresh, it's a yeah. fresh, fresh, it's yeah. a floral one. For me, it's um, incense. I, I, I like the incense thing. It's yeah. quite cool. I also thought uh, interesting what you said, <clears throat> Christina, you know, about what you like. As I said, I'm not as literate about Burgundy as yourself and don't have the experience, but I found it interesting that you said you like Beaujolais as well. Yeah. As I grew up with Beaujolais as well a lot and the lightness and the density. And yeah. I don't know, this has a bit of Beaujolais well, soul that, in that it. That the floral uh, fl pretty, florality. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think it's also. I don't know how Jean Yves does it because this is 100% whole bunch and 100% new oak, so you wouldn't expect it to be so pretty in its youth. I, I always am of the mindset that a great wine that's in, you know, for me, great wine, as you said earlier, Dan, um, is a lot of the times defined by balance. And, um, and I think wines that are in, that are in balance are always in balance. Uh, you, you can say, we yeah. can easily taste this and yeah, say, this is very youthful. There's obviously a lot more potential for this to age and evolve and reveal so much um, more beyond what it's revealing right now. But it's just so delicious right now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly that. Exactly that. A question to you, maybe, or Derek, you so experienced with Burgundian wine. When you would taste this one blind, where where would you put it? Would you would you or even in in terms where in the world? And then also, if you would put it in Burgundy, would you put it in Vone Romane? You as a I, I would say 100% von Romanet 2014 Domaine Bizot. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Of course. Um, you are a very good taster. So <laughs> nailed it. Nailed it. Knew well, it. Right. Derek. <laughs> no, it's interesting. It. Uh, no, it, it really does have, um, for me, von Romanet really is, uh, it, it reveals some of this power, but it also has this, um, this uh, elegance as well in terms of the, the aromatic profile, giving this contrast of uh, um, these, th this wonderful, pretty floral personality in contrast to the density of the fruit and, and, and some of that sous bois character. But I mean, obviously every, 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 every wine, every vineyard and every producer is a little bit different, but um, it's, that, it's that contrast of that um, elegance and power is what I usually look for for Von Romanet. So, um, you know, in hindsight, obviously, and knowing that it's from Von Romanet, it seems very obvious to me. If you poured it to me blind, um, um, I don't know, but it, it definitely has some of that. The new oak, it gives it this caress and this, this, uh, this approach that uh, um, could lead you to, be, to place it in, in you know, many different places in the world. But I think when you taste it on the palate and you feel some of that sapidity and that, that character, um, you know, it, it, it's, it screams vaughn. It's interesting, actually, after a while, um, and my very, very naive palate will, of red wine will, will place it. It's interesting how, how um, powerful the oak comes across after a while and but I'd be very you know it would be it would be interesting after you know two three hours to see whether the oak starts mm. to overpower or whether we start to see a balance coming back in I don't know I think Roughly. it's a I think it's a, use, a youthful thing as well because like um so Fabien Dupere who does the Beaujolais he's now stopped doing oak altogether but um back when he used to do a high percentage of oak um, I've tasted younger wines of his, which are a bit like, oh, there's oak there. Then I tasted a 10 the other day, which, which was back when he used a high percentage on Gamay. And you couldn't tell at all. If I'd been buying tasted, yeah. I would have been like, no oak whatsoever. And I think it's, you know, it's not a dogmatic approach necessarily, even though that's how they're making it. But it's, you know, they're, it's, it's a harmony between the fruit. They're not isolated from each other. They're yeah. making, they're using a, vi a, a barrel aging, an elevage process to match the wine, just as, um, you know, they're growing grapes to befit that process. So it's kind of a... Um, it's not mutually I've exclusive. I spoke to a, a few winemakers about about Bizot using 100% whole bunch and 100% new wood, and they were like, he can do what he wants because yeah. the fruit's there. So, Derek, what have you brought for us, and why is it special for you? 
Um, so, so tonight I brought uh, the Gevry Chambertin 2009 uh, village level wine from uh, Domaine Claude Dugas. It's interesting to me because I, I like Pinot Noir to be, uh, or in my head, on paper, I like uh, Armand Rousseau, um, this kind of uh, uh, ethereal, really profound, but uh, you know, transparent and, and captivating for all these different reasons. Gevry and, and another kind of producers alike, Philippe Pacolet, um, from Jerry Chambertin, some of his wines I think are really captivating. Um, and Claude Dugas is really, in many ways, the antithesis of what I think I would love about um, Burgundy. You know, it's he's very, in many ways, very similar to Bizot. Um, he's working to achieve really densely concentrated fruits, very low yields, mm -hmm. farms biodynamically, everything's horse plowed. Um, he makes very tiny amounts of, of wines, but um, to create these really dense and interesting Pinot Noir and you know for me I'm, I think of the Burgundies I like to be very ethereal and very elegant and, and, and lifted and, and um, you know on their tippy toes not to be something so powerful which um, Claude Dugas wines in, in many ways can be but I've tasted a number of cuvées and it was the 2005 La Vosa and Jacques from Claude Dugas that I tasted that I just couldn't stop thinking about the wine I mean I it was just it sat it stuck with me it was like eating the densest, most flavorful blueberries and blackberries, and you know, densely packed wild, um, wild, wild, uh, um, you know, brambly berries from the forest, and all through it was this unmistakable and this captivating um, spine um, of the Gevry terroir, just kind of screaming through, giving you this sapidity and this um, um, this uh, uh, depth to it, which I thought contrasted so profoundly with the um, concentration of fruit, which was so seductive. And his wines always kind of captivated me since then, and um, they're, really, they're, really, they're really different. And, and you know, we'll see in the 2009, which is a very warm vintage, and it's interesting to see how that vintage has evolved uh, um, and how the wines have even gained further spine, I think, in, in, in many of the great examples. Um, but yeah, I've, so I just grew to be fascinated with his wines, and, um, in spite of myself, I guess, and I think that my personal relationship with the domain and in my um, my disagreements with him on paper, in terms of maybe not thinking or, or in, in the way that it challenged my uh, my ideas about what great Burgundy should be, is I think what's uh, um, created the relationship I have with the wine. So um, I love I love Burgundy. I love I love Gevry Chambertin, and I love so many different producers and how they contrast with each other. And I think that helps me appreciate the perspectives of each because I don't think one's necessarily better. I, you know, I was talking to Philippe Pacolet um, about you know comparing his Lavo Saint Jacques to Cl Domaine Claude Dugas' Lavo Saint Jacques, and philosophically they couldn't disagree anymore. Claude Dugas is uh, completely destemmed. Philippe Pacolet is completely whole cluster. You know, they're making wines from the same vineyard and and from completely different. Um, um, perspectives and it just makes me love and fascinated with the perspectives of both because they each have this unmistakable expression of where they're from but in completely different interpretations and, and, and that's what fascinates me about Burgundy and in the same way that we're seeing this with uh, the champagnes and the Burgundy that you've brought you know it's what's part so, partly so fascinating with Pinot Noir obviously these great wines are dependent on great soils and great vineyards but um, let's get some in the glass and See if you all see if you all hate it. It sounds already mouth watering. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh wow! So with um, so Domingue, uh, so Claude Dugas, he he uses 100% new oak on his um, um, premier cru, premier crew uh, wines and above. It's with really low yields. It, everything that he does is essentially to achieve in the same way with Bizot concentration in the vineyard um, and. His, uh, his cousin, uh, Bernard Dugapi, is a, another famous um, heralded uh, cult producer that uh, maybe in some ways works um, somewhere in between Bizot and, um, and Claude Dugas. Works with a bit of whole cluster, um, works with a lot of gnocchi, you know, philosophically in the vineyards there's a lot of similarities. Um, but uh, all of these producers are in, um, have many things in common to say different and, and differ very much from uh, um, more, you know, let's say, producers who are working in a much more different kind of traditional way with uh, less new oak. But one of the things about Burgundy is we, we, we often overlook how much new oak it is used. I mean, all of the, most of the great domains are these, you know, these wines that command thousands of pounds a bottle. M many of them use 100% new oak on their Premier Cru or Grand Cru 
wines. And um, for me, I'm, I'm, I generally, with wines, think that I, I gravitate to wines that don't have any new oak. And, and even in Burgundy, um, I wanted to use his, uh, uh, for Dugat today, I wanted to choose his Gevry Chambertin, which doesn't use 100% new oak. There is some new barrels, but uh, um, I think it's usually maybe half or less than half. And um, you'll feel the presence of the barrel. But as you can see from, you know, to see it side by side with the Bizeau, you know, the Dugat on the left is, is, is five years older than the Bizeau. And it's still you know, it's significantly more uh, more densely concentrated in, in, mm. in its in its color. Um, if you're looking at the two wines, you'd, you'd probably say that the wine and the uh, that the Dugas is even younger, um, and and that's of Bizot who works in a very concentrated similar way. So it's not like he's doing any sort of uh, um, you know um, uh, very delicate approach. Let's say Claude Dugas is um, in Burgundy, depending on who you ask, is it's a, it's a very polarizing domain, and I and I, and that's part of why I wanted to pick it because it's uh, um, it's just one shade of Jevry Chambertin. It's just one interpretation of Lavos and Jack, and I think each of those perspectives is equally important, but um, they're very different. But when you look at these processes and what he does, he's a uh, it's a you know uh, cult Burgundian domain. But you see a very similar approach by a producer like Roberto Fuerzio in uh, Barolo, and he's regarded as uh, you know the modernist or the uh, revolutionary vigneron in, in that. But uh, you know it, it's interesting you put them in different locations, but there's a very similar philosophy to their dedication in the vineyard, and um, maybe negatively um, or too easily associated with their their vinification. I think that's also how I like to see um, Gevray in comparison to Vaughan Romani. You have sort of the terroir and, and everything expressed really clearly in both, but it's, it's sort of like the more muscular Gevray and the more sort of pretty and floral von. I think it's a great representation of both. But. Yeah, and I think, as you say, the contrast to each other is really fascinating to see yeah. von yeah. Gevray. They're, they're very different in their vinification, but there are so many harmonious philosophies to how they, how they grow um, that it really gives you that. It makes it easier to see the contrast in the terroir. And, um, it's fascinating. Both of these wines, I, 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 I can't put a label on them. They're so unique and charismatic and they have so much personality. And I love that about it because I, I don't have to think where it's from. I just think it's good wine. But of course, the little wine geek in me starts to think somewhere, where could this be? And with this one, the nose is for me Pinot. Yeah. But when I have it in the mouth, as you said, Christina, the black fruit and... And there's also this bit of savory, herbal. If you give this to me blind, I would maybe think, maybe this could be Barolo somewhere. Or maybe even, maybe in a bit somewhere middle of Italy. I mean, that's your region, you, you know that as well. And, and, and why I say this also has another reason when we, we did a lot of tastings like with older, very old Barolos versus Burgundy. And I'm always fascinated how, how these two taste almost the same when they're like 20, 30, 40 years old, then they move closer to each other. And it's, it's and this is like in young, it's, it's really fascinating, I mm. think. It's, I've never drunk something like this, it's so unique. It's just interesting too, in the progression of the wines we've tasted to see that evolution in the concentration and kind of um, the amplification of the Pinot, I guess we could say in this. And I think it works really way, really, works really well in the ascension of the four wines we tasted tonight, but again, each one, with each of these wines, would be for different people. I mean, if we're if we're looking to friends or family or or, or customers or or you know followers on social media, everyone's going to have a different perspective on on uh, which one would be more to their taste. And and um, so it's always fascinating to me when people say, oh, you know, you have customers, or people say, I don't really like Pinot Noir. Or I said, well, that's so many things. There's a whole world that you're saying within that. And I always think that that's an interesting thing to explore to try to find like. What is, uh, what is the people, you know, what's their style that they might gravitate to? Because these Pinots are very different on a similar end of the spectrum, but um, will be very polarizing to some, some people. And, and, and I, think that that's, I think that's interesting because I think they're made with equal integrity to many others. Can I make a quick point? Because yeah. I do this quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> How unbelievable it is to go back to champagne at the end. <laughs> 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 to lift up. Uh, because I, t I do tend to find, uh, I, uh, this is obviously the why I've become a champagne geek <laughs> more than anything else, is I, I, red wines I do tend to find I need food, I need something to help me through the process. Um, and then it, when you're having them as they are, and they're, they're two beautiful red wines, 
but but um, I, I need something to then lift. And when you go back to Champagne, be it Rosé or, or Blanc, you get this little kind of oof, and it just lifts you back up into that, uh, that moment. So th thanks so much, you guys, for coming, for bringing these amazing wines from your cellars. And uh, um, it's been a really, really nice conversation, really ex exciting wines, and uh, um, really nice to explore Pinot in so many different, uh, um, in so many different shades. Um, obviously, it's a much broader um, world beyond just this small section that we looked at, but uh, really fascinating. Um, thanks to everyone at Kitchen Table for, for hosting us in the beautiful restaurant, and uh, cheers. Santé. 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 À la vie, à l'amour.